the HSMC 50, and uh, it just noticed it is being recorded. Uh, so particular thanks to uh, Professor Jeffrey Braithwaite, who in addition to his inverted commas day job at the Australian Institute of Health Innovation, is also an honorary professor at the University of Birmingham. And Jeffrey's visited us a number of times and uh, uh, we've always enjoyed Jeffrey's visits. Unfortunately, this time he's visiting us virtually, but I'm sure the visit will be just as enjoyable. So Jeffrey said he'll speak for about 45 minutes or so, and he's given us a very broad topic, which is the future of healthcare to 2030. So Jeffrey, over to you, please. Thank you, Martin. And I'd just like to acknowledge Ross, the interim director of HSMC and my very, very good colleague, Russell Manion. Uh, and Russell is the architect of some of the work that I'm going to discuss here uh, this morning. So, um, I'm glad you said what you said, Martin, because I couldn't recall who designed the title. I couldn't remember if you said to me, Jeffrey, I want you to talk about the future and uh, you must solve the problem of the NHS by 2030 or whether I did. So Martin, if it goes really well, we can say that you designed the title. And if it all ends in a car crash, then you can say, oh, that was Jeffrey. He uh, sort of said that was the title. So seriously, colleagues, I've been thinking about with colleagues across the world, what is healthcare going to be like and how might it unfold across this decade? And I was thinking about this pre-pandemically and then something big hit us, did it not? A big crisis, a big pandemic. So um, I'm going to go back to pre-pandemically and take us through the pandemic and then think with you, what are we gonna do to create a better health system by 2030? And um, what, are the, what, are the, what are the pathways, what are the potential ways we could go? And then I'm going to especially draw for this audience implications for the international community, for those of us who are in the audience, who, who are on the, on, on the web uh, seminar um, from outside of the NHS and also for the NHS itself. So that's the audacious task. And now let me try and deliver on that. So as Martin said, I'm from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation in my day job. Uh, and we are a, a, a group that's a bit different from HSMC. We don't have the teaching programs of HSMC, but we're very similar. And we're, it's easy to map us to HSMC in terms of our research interests. Um, and we don't have a laboratory. We don't you know, have test tubes and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, microscopes, our laboratory, is the health systems of Australia and the world. And we are very interested in how do we improve them. So our, um, our logo, our mission is heal, learn, discover. I personally spend most of my time in discovery doing research, um, but the object is to heal and learn as well. And of course, as you know, those of you who have visited Australia, it's like this at roughly dusk on every day, except the last six months when we've had rain continuously and it feels like maybe Birmingham on a, on, a, on a very bad week. And that's been going for about six months and we've had flooding in fact. So um, the Institute itself, we have seven centers, four university centers and three funded by our equivalent to the NIHR or the MRC. We call that the NH and MRC. Um, uh, and so we have seven centers devoted to different aspects of health systems improvement. And what you see is on the can is what's inside. The titles of the centers roughly map to our whole work footprint and the programs of work that we have. So I just show that slide so you can meet these people, but it gives you a flavor for the work we do without me having to talk about it for 10 minutes. So let me do the talk. Enough of the advertising about the Research Institute uh, that I belong to. Let's do the talk. Um, so th this talk's in six parts. The first part is the problem from a research perspective. So most of the people on the seminar will know the problems that we face. And here's one way to conceptualize them. It takes 17 years for only 14% of new discoveries to end a practice. Those of you who aren't researchers all the time, 
There's 28 million papers in Pub PubMed and 75 randomized trials and 11 systematic reviews published every day. So the volume of the knowledge explosion is absolutely massive and not all of that evidence goes through to change practice or be taken up. About 60% of care is what we might call high quality care in line with level one evidence where there's a randomized trial to say, that's the care that the doctor should give you or is based on the guidelines that the clinicians prescribe for the condition that they're treating. About 30% in most health systems is waste. If you're the US health system, there's probably bigger amounts of waste. And if you're the NHS or Australia, it's probably a little bit less than that. And what I mean by waste is test results that never get seen because the patient's already discharged or administrative burden that's not productive or treatments that shouldn't be given but are or treatments or care that's marginal for the patient and yet are still deployed and, uh, and used as interventions. And about 10% of patients are harmed. Most harm is small scale and doesn't um, cause morta mortality, but there's enough harm around for us to be concerned. And the 10% number has been sticky over a couple of decades. In fact, all of these numbers have been very sticky. This is kind of what developed health systems like Australia's and the NHS produce lots and lots of good care, but these kind of data cause us to think, maybe we could run a better health system. Maybe we could improve on these numbers. I published a paper in BMC Medicine the last couple of years, uh, exactly quantifying this and arguing what I just argued over the last couple of, uh, couple of uh, slides. And it's pretty obvious that if you, if you just looked at these three numbers without looking at all the other KPIs that exist in the NHS, and you got more evidence-based care in line with the guidelines, higher quality care, less waste and less harm, you'd have a better health system. I'm gonna repeat that when we get to the end of this talk and see what you think then. So there've been many solutions to these problems, haven't there? HSMC, in fact, publishes papers often which map to just this, how do we get a better health system? So one solution is the knowledge pipeline. That is to say, let's do basic research, go through various other aspects of research through to clinical trials, do some technology assessment, health services research, knowledge management type research, getting knowledge into practice, lots of HSMC papers on that, and then we'll have a better delivery system. The problem with that is a pipeline is at best an idealization, and at worst, it's actually a misdirection of what really happens in the real world. So there's lots of blockages and fractures in the pipeline that mean that care doesn't get improved. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a slide earlier that says it takes 17 years for about 14% of evidence to get into practice. The pipeline would work routinely and practice would be evidence-based much more than it is now. So there's lots of ways that research doesn't get through and that there's failure of the research enterprise. So just put that to one side. That's the first part. I'm specifying, if you like, the problem that we're faced with, with trying to create a better health system to 2030. And I'm saying there's lots of solutions of a pipeline nature that haven't worked to the extent we would like them to. So I'm now going to drill into, well, why might that be the case and what can we do differently? So it's pretty obvious to anybody who does policymaking or research or management or clinical practice or is a member of a patient group trying to advocate for a better health system. And I think I just about covered all the major stakeholders then. Um, and if I missed you, I don't mean to. You can come back in during Q&A. But it's a complex system. But the pipeline model and models like that suggest solutions are linear. If I do X, then downstream Y will occur. But the health system's complex, incredibly complex. Now, what do I mean by that? Complex systems are everywhere. It's not just the health system that's complex. Think about the family, especially the extended family and its relationship to its environment, its larger ecosystem. If you're an IT person, a data person, think about 
the network's data system, which you access or work on to try and make other people's lives easier. Think about parliaments. Think about the political ecosystem. That's another complex system. Think about the human brain, which apparently is the most complex thing in the universe. But not all systems are complex. They appear to be, but they're not as complex as other systems. However, it's really simple to solve any health system problem, not just a, panic, a pandemic. So the solutions are really simple either, not just the system we're working on to try and improve it. Health systems problems are typically complex, not linear. So, the problem is those at the top and the NHSs, all four of them in the UK are an example of this, those at the top often persist with top-down solutions. But there's well-known disadvantages with that. Poor leadership impact, less room for creativity on the front lines of care, team disengagement, low proximity from the people, you'll describe them as in Whitehall, us perhaps in Canberra, to the people on the ground who are best able to make decisions in a decentralized way for the benefit of their local communities. So there's this tussle between top-down, wanting to be in control by the people who are paying or distributing the funding for the system, and those who are doing the work in the organizations that deliver care and clinicians on the front lines. So if that's the case, if we have a problem, a mismatch in some health systems between people specifying top-down solutions, solutions, and care on the ground, we better understand care on the ground and how it actually works a bit better than perhaps we pay attention to now. So in support of this, we published a white paper that's getting a lot of downloads and a lot of citations over the couple of years since we published it on complexity science in healthcare and how the complex system works rather than thinking about it in a linear way in the way I was describing, I was describing in the earlier slides. So in summary, just so you don't have to read a 110 page uh, white paper, although I do recommend you read it, and it's a free download from our website. In summary, um, the complexity of the system is about populations of agents and their artifacts, the things they use, the buildings they inhabit, the tools they use to create care or do their bit of the health system, interacting dynamically with emergent rules and governance mechanisms and much of the care that's delivered is delivered not by the top-down people who specify things, policies, for example, but by bottom-up networks of people delivering care to their local communities. So here's a couple of studies we've done to just exemplify that. We do a lot of work. Um, it's not the only research we do, but uh, one strand of our research is to look at the networks on the ground that deliver care. So here's an example in the eastern suburbs of Sydney near um, Bondi Beach, if you've been to, uh, if you've been to Sydney, um, the, 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 the healthcare facilities that are clustered around that eastern coast of Sydney. Um, and it's a cancer research network. And this is a bunch of people like me who are researchers working with a bunch of oncologists, oncology nurses and other cancer uh, carers to try and get more evidence into practice. And it's a longitudinal piece of research. So each dot is a person and each line is a collaborative tie between them in a classic network analysis of the front lines of care um, and, the and the researchers like me who are working with the front lines to deliver better care. And so that's what the network looked like in 2012. And that's what the network looked like in 2013. That's what the network looked like in 2015. That's what it looked like in 2020. And this is what it looked like in 2021. So clearly something is happening where we are building a coalition of people who are very interested in delivering better, higher quality, more evidence-based care to populations of people. And we're building a coalition, a collaboration of people to do that. Now that's much better in my view than the top-down policymakers right up there in the upper echelons of the system trying to prescribe the way folks like this should deliver care. This is a much more lateral, horizontal view 
of how collaboration can provide the support services to produce better quality care. Here's another example. Genomics is all the rage. There's uh, Genomics England doing lots of work to try and get um, um, uh, more genomics data into decision-making so we make better decisions about diagnosis and treatment for people with cancer, rare diseases, or anything really, any disease or condition that's amenable to a genomics um, a set of data to help with diagnosis and treatment. So we've got the equivalent of Genomics England, Australian, and I know, and I know there's one in uh, Scotland and the other uh, parts of the NHS, NHSs, um, and we've got Australian Genomics. So again, we did a network diagram. These are the people who we collaborated together before we got Australian Genomics going in 2016. And this is what the network map looked like when we'd really developed a whole lot of collaborations to try and get more genomic data into routine practice and to uh, provide better care to patients. So you can see this sort of model uh, where you get some research dollars and some researchers working horizontally with the clinicians is a, is a strong model for building collaborations for better care. So in summary, with the complexity side of things, healthcare is complex, it's a complex adaptive system. It's adaptive without necessarily waiting for top-down initiatives. Those initiatives I mentioned were really on the back of research grants and willing clinicians and policymakers and managers, rather than waiting for anybody top-down to tell us to do something. Um, behaviors are emergent, that is, they're not that predictable in a complex adaptive system. They're not that predictable ahead of time. Bottom up uh, um, uh, enactment produces localized rules, which are often sufficient to guide behavior and produce good care. Linear models only get you so far, and we have to factor all this in to the way we deliver care to patients. Okay, so now I've done an extended specification of some of the systems problems that I live, eat and breathe and spend my sleepless nights worrying about um, uh, as a researcher working in translational research with a whole lot of people in the system to try and deliver better care to patients. So what about visions for the future? So the best source in recent times was the Lancet Commission, but there's other sources on what should the health system do now that we've had a pandemic, this is during the pandemic, the Lancet Commission, what should we do to try and forge a better future for the NHS? So I'm drawing on this. Now this is the Lancet's um, priorities for action. This is what the Lancet said are the key things that we need to work on to provide a better NHS. Uh, funding, social care funding, spending wisely, you, you know, using resources uh, get to get good bang for the, pound, uh, strategic workforce planning, pandemic preparedness and response, because it's not about this pandemic, it's about the next pandemic as well, uh, or crisis, uh, improving population health, optimizing diagnosis, promoting innovation and quality improvement and strengthening integration. Now, I know it's impossible for people when I go onto my next slides to keep nine things in their head, but just reflect on that a little with me, because I'm going to come back to it. Just for completeness, the other thing the Lancet Commission did was made a series of recommendations. They made seven, and they're around increased investment, better resource management, a sustainable, skilled, fit-for-purpose workforce, strength and prevention and preparedness for protection of the system and the population, develop di and enhance diagnostics to improve treatment and outcomes and genomics and those sort of things would be in there, become a learning health system, I must say, most health systems I know, they're better at forgetting than learning. And we're gonna have a whole workshop on that. Um, and to improve, and quality improvement, and then to improve integration across the sectors to have a more, inter so patients don't fall through the cracks. Okay, so nine priority actions and, and, and seven uh, recommendations. So just hold that loosely in your head. I know you can't keep nine plus seven, it's not feasible. But um, just hold that loosely in your head. And some of you, of course, are architects of this and know this back to front and inside out. You don't have to wait for somebody from 12,000 miles away to tell you what's in the Lancet. So there's lots of other voices about what should happen with the NHS. And here's just a few that I've picked up because I'm good with Google images 
and uh, I've spliced some into a slide. Um, and it's NHS challenges, investment and support needed from NHS providers. How good is the NHS? The future of the NHS, um, measurement of, uh, of uh, indicators and, uh, and, 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 and you know, moving forward through measuring and enhancing progress. And there's some jarring notes from some people too. Ideas like the Tories are going to take over and privatize everything and it's going to become like the US health system. Um, and, it, you know, Alison Pollack is famous for her, uh, her alternative uh, perspective and some would say realistic perspective about what's really happening under the hood in the NHS. Um, not for me to play politics and make politic, political, uh, political judgments from 12,000 miles away. Um, but I wonder if we can just swing around to the audience now, Martin. Uh, and um, ask a question. We're partway through the talk. We haven't got to Q&A yet. This is just interim Q&A, just like Ross is interim director of the HSMC. This is interim Q&A. Um, what's the future of the NHS look like to you? I'm giving some of these pontifications on a rainy Sydney you know, evening. Uh, what do you reckon? I'm happy to take stuff in the chat or people can... Can they talk, Martin? I'm not sure how we've got this configured. Maybe without putting anybody on the spot, Martin, Ross, Russell, Mannion, do you want to, you deal with this sort of stuff all the time. Have you got a comment? Ross, yes, you've Ross got your hand. raised his hand. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey, for your thoughts and insights um, regarding the landscape pre, during, and we can come on to post, post-pandemic. I think one of the, the learnings for, for experience of, of the NHS and, and what the pandemic shed, shed a light on is, is health, the health inequalities um, and how within harms and within discussions about safety, there are groups that are dis, disproportionately exposed to harms. Um, and that, that's really seen to be brought, brought, up to, brought up to the foreground. And I'm, I'm reflecting on, on that currently as I walk the streets. Uh, in relation to how some of the ideas around complexity, localized rules, and those types of dynamics, and 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 the extent to which those maybe need to be shaped or or or, or reviewed in light of, of 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 what's you know been brought up to more public discussion about health inequality. So I'd I'd welcome any thoughts that you had about about that. If that was possible. We might uh, cover that a bit later. Okay. Ross, it's such a central issue, but it's okay. fantastic that you've raised it. Okay, I'm not speaking specifically about inequalities, but it's it's reared its head in every country. Okay. And the pandemic has brought it so much into focus in Australia as well. We've okay. got someone else, Catherine. Thanks, Jeffrey. Really interesting uh, set of comments today. Um, I guess my feeling as a social care researcher is that the NHS will continue to be privileged and kind of almost fetishized over social care. And so I guess I'm kind of, that would be maybe my provocation is that it continues to suck up all the resources. We've got a health and social care levy coming in next year, almost all of which will go to the NHS. So I guess I'm seeing that the NHS has got a you know, relatively rosy future compared to social care. Catherine, you know, um... I don't know how normalized it was when the London Olympics were on in 2012, when they did the opening ceremony, but the fact that the NHS <laughs> and they had nurses with beds in the arena, it, it, probably, it probably reflected something about British society and its, um, and its feeling of the NHS. So I'm not surprised that it sucks up more resources than perhaps a social care researcher might, um, might agree with. Uh, it, it's part of the fabric of, um, of the country. No, and, and, you know, when, when the Olympics come to Sydney, say, we would not dream of having nurses and doctors on beds in an arena, um, uh, you know, celebrating the Australian health system. It just doesn't have the same feel about it or embeddedness in the culture. So it, it, it is interesting that you see that as a, as a problem um, from a social care point of view. Russell Manion has a hand up. Thanks, Jeffrey. I, I've just put in the uh, in the chat box. I think the immediate pressures are around workforce issues, particularly post Brexit. We've just not got enough staff. And the second thing is large waiting times on the back of COVID. So there, I think they're two of the key ones. Yeah, and that and so, and, and and that is so in Australia too, uh, Russell. 
Okay, I might press on. You will have your own views, um, other people in the audience. So jot down your comments if you like, or put them in the chat and let's see if we can return to them. So let me press on. So let's have a look at some other views. And what I'm gonna draw on now is work that Russell, in fact, and I have been doing um, over the last uh, five or six years with um, people in 152 different countries. So let me talk a bit about that. So uh, Russell Mannion and I, and uh, uh, alongside some colleagues, are, are editors on a series of books on health reform across the world. So I'm now broadening out from Australia and the NHS to other health systems. And so we published a book at first on health, health reform, quality and safety, and we involved 30 countries. Uh, looking at their initiatives around how do you keep uh, uh, care safer and of higher quality for patients. This is low, middle income and high income countries. The next one, we asked everybody in 60 countries, our authors, to write a chapter on a success story that would be useful for other countries to learn from. That was the second book. But I'm going to draw on the third book where we ask people to take an issue or a case study or whatever it might be, and project that across time and tell us where they thought, having done that assignment, each of the chapter writers, having done that assignment, they thought the health system was heading. And then Russell and I and some colleagues pulled that together and said, okay, this is kind of a little bit of a roadmap for the future on where people think their health systems are heading. So we called it Future Predictions. And that's the book that I'm going to draw on for the next few slides. So um, if you want to get it, by the way, it's on Amazon, but um, you know, the publishers slap a huge price on these, so I'm going to summarize it in the next few slides. Although you're most welcome to have it, I think it looks really cool. Don't you think it looks cool on people's bookshelves behind them, Russell? I'm just searching you to see if you've got it on your bookshelf. Uh, or it can be used as a fantastic doorstop if you uh, have trouble with a swinging door. So what lessons can be taken from this sort of global outlook on the future of health systems? And this is pre-pandemically. So the gray colored in countries are the ones that didn't make it into the book. All the colored ones did. So we covered almost all the world. 152 countries are covered somewhere, either by dealing with a whole region with a multiplicity of countries or asking specific countries to write a chapter from their perspective. So this is a big effort. Lots and lots of authors. And Russell and I had the job of herding the cats and commenting on all the chapters, you know, Martin, you've done this, Ross, you've done this. It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a task, but it's a delightful one because you get the received wisdom of all these people all assembled in one place. So what did the book say? What is our summary of all of this? Well, there are five trends shaping health systems of the future. These are trends that are happening, whether we do anything or not. They seem almost to have been wound up and they are unfolding across really wealthy health systems, high income health systems, a bit in middle income, less so in low income, but they seem to be quite becoming universal trends. Everyone's trying to figure out how they make their healthcare sustainable. That is to say, equitably delivering care. This is your equity issue, Ross and Catherine. How do you deliver care so it's paid for and equitably distributed across in a sustainable way across time. The genomics revolution, uh, most of the wealthy countries are really saying now that the human genome has been uh, uh, unlocked, how do we use that data to target uh, specific treatments to specific people? And that's about precision medicine and a whole lot of new tools that clinicians have at their disposal. The third thing is emerging technologies. There's two kinds of technologies. There's information and communication technologies. And there's diagnostic and treatment modality type technologies. The fourth issue, the fourth trend running through all health systems up to wherever the future is, are the changing global demographics. Mainly that means that most countries are aging, but also the populations are becoming uh, more demanding, or perhaps we could say medicine can do more, and therefore there are more treatments available to populations. Also though, there are more refugees uh, and more people changing countries, although the pandemics halted that a bit, than ever before in human history. And so that's also changing the global demographic dynamics and therefore the dynamics of who do you treat in your country with your health system. 
And then finally, new models of care. And if there's one thing the pandemic did, it was hasten some ways of delivering care in a distributed way, such as through telemedicine, telehealth. So these are five trends that seem to be running through health systems like Australia's and the NHS's and other health systems. Um, almost these are happening now in any case. This is not, we don't have to do any more architecture about those things, they are occurring. The next thing is there are nine specific strategies, a bit like the Lancet actions, priority actions, that are being orchestrated by health systems across the world. So these are nine, if you like, activity groups or strategies. The, the, the Lancet Commission called them, um, I think, priority actions. And, and they're very much, if you remember the nine Lancet ones, these are very much mapped to the Lancet ones. They're just expressed in a slightly different way. Remember we wrote this book in 2018 and did the work on it leading up to 2018. Okay, so it predates the pandemic and predates the Lancet Commission. Integration of services, because you need more joined up care. Finance, economics, and insurance, however you pay for healthcare, you're gonna to have to pay for it. Taxpayer funded, health insurance, co-payments, whatever. Patient-based care and empowering the patient, giving the patient a voice more than we used to in the past. Universal healthcare, that's the mantra of WHO at the moment and was just before the pandemic, and that will come back that as being very important. The whole technology group of harnessing technology for the benefit of patients. Six, seven, and eight, and nine are aging populations, dealing with aging populations. That's partly social care, I guess. It's not acute care, but it's about residential age care and about looking after the most vulnerable. Preventive care, we can't just keep thinking about hospitals when we think of healthcare. Hospitals are just part of healthcare. They're not even the main game to a large extent. Accreditation standards, policy, all that group of the more top-down things that are specifications for how care should occur. And then the workforce issue, which you often talk about, both Ross and Martin, uh, about it being important. And you said earlier, Ross, about the workforce. Um, you know, the workforce of the present is not the workforce of the future because of the, all, the, all the other things that are happening technologically and, uh, and uh, with aging uh, workforce and many other factors. So those are nine solutions that arise from a considered view of 150 countries. Uh, I think there was 148 authors plus us as editors trying to grapple with this. So it's a wisdom of crowds thing. So I put it on a slide. So these are the nine strategies, things that we need to fix, whatever title, I'm, I'm not big on titles, whatever you want to call those things in the middle. This is the way the system, as we know it, or where we're coming from, if you want to be kind, fragmented and siloed, volume-based care, provider-oriented, barriers to access and affordability, that's part of the, the equity thing, static, legacy-based IT systems, unhealthiness amongst the population, poor health literacy, focus on acute care too much, entrenched levels of poor quality, unsafe care, uneven workforce training, knowledge and development. Then you have the nine things, and then you have what the health system might look like by 2030 if we can get it right. So this is very synergistic, is it not, with the Lancet Health Commission stuff. Cohesive and joined up, value-based care, person-centered, wide access without financial hardship, machine learning and AI enabled, data-driven clinical decision-making, well-being, healthy aging and health-aware population, shift to primary health-promoting preventative care, not just acute care, less harmful, more effective services. I do lots of work on patient safety. There are some heart-rending stories when we get it wrong. And a fit-for-purpose, highly trained and sustainable workforce. So that's the blueprint for 2030, according to our distillation of the work we've done in the 152 countries future predictions book, plus some other work we've done. So now I get to the punchline. What are the implications for the NHS and stakeholders? The question is, how do we get to this version of 2030? Because it's not guaranteed. 
sure, those trends that I said about genomics being inevitable and we'll ha harness the data and changing population dynamics and new models of care, of course, there's an inevitability about some of those, but the actual securing of a better health system by 2030 just is not guaranteed. We need to get to this, the right-hand side of this map. There's many ideas about how to get there. And you've been the architect of some of them, I know that. The WHO sees it as managing change and innovation. Uh, they see a transformational model and they write about that and that's in their documentation. But lots of other people have had a go at this too. I'm really good at looking at Google images and downloading people's models. There's models galore. I haven't actually made them big because I'm not meaning for you to look at them. You can Google image too, uh, or look in the literature, or look in people's books, or look at just the HSMC output and see what people have done to try and say, how do we transform health systems? Then you need a change model, don't you? And there's lots of ideas there. There's the ADCAR model and Cotter's eight steps. Uh, and the McKinsey 7S change model and the sort of transformational putting the patient and the family in the center and the learning health model. And I've even spliced in one of our other books on transforming healthcare with qualitative research, just because who doesn't like an ad for their own work? So my take on this, and I'm coming to the punchline um, uh, and the take home value of all of this arc of stuff that I've been trying to distill for you in this talk about trying to get healthcare to 2030. My take on it, I'd like to leave you with five suggestions. The first one is whether you are a researcher or a policymaker or a manager or a clinician or anyone else, you spend a lot of time in your box, in your part of the health system and inevitably you think some of the time, at least, in a linear way. So if you're a researcher, you get a grant, A, and you will try and realize a consequence for that downstream, B. If you're a clinician, you try and get a diagnosis, and then you will have a treatment plan, B. If you're a policymaker, you design new policy, and then you try and put it into practice and implement it to have effects to constrain or enable behaviors. All of us are in our own box quite a lot of the time, but then you step out of the box armed with your research grant or your policy or your diagnosis, and suddenly you find the work, the world is a complex adaptive system in the way I've been describing. So my first plea to everyone is get out of your box, embrace the complexity and do your bit to do the needed transformation to create the health system of 2030. Because if you're just gonna wait for everybody else, it ain't gonna happen. You've gotta do your bit. So my first suggestion is all of us, and I'm talking to myself as well, get out of your box and embrace the world. The second one is I presented lots and lots of change management models and transformation ideas in a very sort of hurried way, deliberately. I think you need, and we all need, an evidence-based model for implementation. And let's call that implementation science. Here's ours, but we published this in 2014, it was based on a systematic review of implementation science at that time. It's a fairly simple model. It says, get ready for change. Think about the capacity for your, your capacity to implement whatever change it is. Think about the types of implementation you're talking about. Think about the resources and the leverage you've got and then think about making it sustainable and monitoring it across time. A relatively simple model, it's relatively easy to say. There are more sophisticated models now because this was a model we published in 2014. You play with many of them, but make sure I'm suggesting that it's evidence-based and not just one that McKinsey dreamed up for the purposes of selling more consulting services to somebody. With all due respect to any consult cons uh, consultancy colleagues on the call. The third thing is you really have, wherever you are in the system, researcher, policymaker, manager, leader, clinician, you really have two jobs. You don't just have one job. The first one is you have to do your job. 
That is to say, you are somewhere in a hierarchy, whether it's in a university or a hospital or a health service or a trust or whatever it might be. And you've got to do the job, you know, the demarcated a job description and you're somewhere in the hierarchy. But the second thing is you have to improve things. The first one is a relatively formal thing. You have to do your job. That's what you're paid for. The second one is a less formal thing. You have to improve things by navigating through all the complexity of the health system. So you actually have two jobs. I know you came tonight, some of you thinking you had one job and it was enough for you, but you actually have two. The fourth point is understand, and I hope I've persuaded you and probably you already knew, that both the solutions and the problems are not linear. They look linear, and sometimes we wish they were linear so that if we did A, B would happen, B would occur, but that's not the case. So use some resources of your own to really understand more deeply the nature of the problems that you're faced with in your part of the transformation. Our suggestion is read our, um, read our uh, Complexity Science in Healthcare white paper, which is a freebie on download, but you might have other sources and you don't just have to read my stuff. The fifth thing is to focus on the importance. What is important? Well, at the systems level, most health systems I know, including the NHSs in the UK and including the Australian health systems, because we've got multiple health systems too, because we've got states and territories and each one has a health system. And they've got lots of KPIs and, um, and uh, uh, targets and goals and numbers that you have to achieve. And I reckon you can boil it all down to three. There are three important numbers in my judgment. We want higher quality care, less waste and less harm. And if we manage to pull that off, we would automatically, regardless of everything I've said previously, have a better health system because we'd have higher quality care, less waste and less harm. And Catherine, we'd even have money that we generate from that to provide for social care. So I'm trying to appeal to everyone in the audience who raises a question, including your plea for not to forget social care. So that's my talk. I'm leaving you with five things for you to do so you're not a passive listener to my, uh, my exegesis, but you're uh, being given a job to do as you move away from this talk. Happy to take discussions, comments, questions, or observations. Here's a wave from some people in sunny Australia. All I want to say, it hasn't been sunny for about six months. So if you're coming to Australia or coming back to Australia anytime soon, such as in October to the Esquire Conference in Brisbane, then we'll try and get rid of all this rain and have it sunny for you. Here's my acknowledgements of some of the teams that, um, are the teams that work with me. Here's some recently published books, because there's not just those books that Russell and I work with, but others that I've been involved with in recent times. Here's some forthcoming books. So if you're ever going to run out of reading, I'm here to cure that problem. And that's how to get hold of me if you want to. I'm going to stop screen sharing and throw this open for discussion. Thank you for participating. Okay, thanks, Jeffrey, for, uh, as expected, a, a tour de force. Um, it's generated quite a few sort of points in the chat already. And as I said, we'll probably, we'll try to take them in roughly chronological order unless there's a, a reason to do so. Um, I can see a couple of people got their hands raised, but we'll go with the chat first. Martin, and, uh, from the chair, shouldn't you have said, Jeffrey, exactly 45 minutes, how on earth did you manage to deliver precisely on time and on budget? Just, you know, just saying. Yes, thanks, Jeffrey. I uh, yeah, forgot to say that. Um, but uh, yes, so tour de force in two senses, not only in content sense, but actually delivered exactly to time as well. A bit like I don't know how that happened, Martin. It was just sheer luck. But yeah, anyway, you're the Swiss you railways of uh, academic <laughs> presentation. Um, right, we will go to the chat first, as I suggested. And a couple of points have been raised in the chat, a couple of points, a couple of questions. Uh, Say so chronologically, the first one in the chat, I think, is Callista. So if you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, make your point or ask a question. I'd, uh, yeah, hello. Um, I'm Hi, one Calista. of the. Hello, yes, uh, I'm one of the graduates, hey, SMC graduates. I used to work in the NHS, not anymore. But um, I, I don't know if I exactly, I made a comment, but 
um, from my own experience, um, I see that all right, central government uh, policies and laws and legislation, etc., and the culture of individual organizations are crucial to uh, delivering good healthcare. Um, I, I don't know how in, in Australia and, and in your experience, you approach all that to ensure that the patients get good care and, and the staff as well. Sorry, that's no, okay. I can talk, I can address that a little bit about culture. Uh, you've raised the issue of culture, which I didn't deal with in this talk, but you know, there's a world expert on culture in the form of Russell Manion in the HSMC, who you can talk to um, uh, and can talk to you about lots of studies on culture. We did one study in 2017 and we asked this um, deceptively simple question. If you've got a good culture somewhere in the NHS, say, or in any, any healthcare organisation, do you get better health outcomes? Do you get better organisational and patient outcomes? Because we hope that's the case, don't we? We hope that if uh, hospital Callista is really, really a good culture productive and everybody works effectively together, you're going to get good patient outcomes versus hospital Jeffrey, where it's toxic and not productive and there's all this politics. And that would do, that hospital, hospital Jeffrey, would produce poor outcomes. Well, we did a systematic review of that in 2017. And what we found was almost universally, if you have a good culture, it's related to better organizational and uh, patient outcomes. So one question that you've raised is about the culture of people working in the NHS. Those parts of the NHS that have a good culture are much more likely to deliver better care. So that's one part of the extensive question that you've asked. Um, and Russell, I'm sure is available to answer any other question on healthcare culture. Okay, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, a lot of the comments in the chat, I think are responses to the question that you asked earlier. So I'm, I'm gonna skip down to the last one in the chat and then go to the hands. So uh, Ross, I think you, you had a comment with a question right at the end. So would you like to go ahead with that one, please? Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Jeffrey, for your thoughts, reflections, the present and the future of, of healthcare. And I think connected to where we go for moving forward, there's discussions, this idea of anchor institutions, um, is sort of being, let's say, experimented with in, in the NHS at the moment, the value that's generated from, from the NHS in terms of you know the, the wider you know employment supply chains and same can be said for universities potentially in the value that that, that universities bring so as well, any thoughts reflections on how how there's any scope for collaboration um across those institutions i welcome any thoughts that you had about that well we keep thinking you're the world's best at that ross the nhs england because of clarks and then you know later yeah. academic uh, yeah. academic connections between universities and uh, health systems. I think your in question inherently says we haven't done all that we mm. hoped we would mm. with those with those um, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But we keep thinking that you've gone further than most health systems with that. So you might be what success looks like, even though it may not feel like it. Interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right. I've got a couple of hands, right? So I'll take them in order that I saw them and order them on my screen. So it's Mark and then uh, Lucia. So Mark. Yeah, th thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, really good to uh, see you and hear you. So uh, th thanks ever so much for that. Um, I had a question which is sort of taking that slightly longer view, really. I've said like the, the last 30 years, and it's really around something around incentives in the system. So I get objectives and, and where it's going, these longer term trends. I think that's fairly, fairly consensual. I think, I think we're agreed there. I think one of the troubles is what, what are the incentives in the system to enable that, to, to achieve your three, the 60, 30, 10, or the, the nine uh, themes? And, and I say that because in, particularly in England, not, not the UK, in England, we've sort of stumbled to the end of 30 years of marketization. There's marketization still going on. There's now a, a greater emphasis on integration. And yet we've also got, um, just very recently, we've had major scandals uh, or, or reports about major scandals, particularly in maternity care, a couple more in maternity care about to come out. And I'm just wondering how we kind of reconcile the kind of uh, improvement at a, an individual patient level for among clinicians, which we can't just rely on altruism uh, 
that their goodwill to to achieve that. And yet the some of the the levers that policymakers have, and, and and I mean that from politicians down to probably organizational executives we've we've sort of um you, you were talking about standards and uh accreditation uh and i'm just wondering is is that the right mix it's, it's going to be a combination of things but is yeah. what's the right mix for this um this new world that you're taking us to in 2030 you know that's a brilliant question mark um and the more i've thought about and studied health systems, I guess the less sure I am about what mix there is. You know, there's that old joke about you come in as the CEO and if it's a centralized organization, you decentralize. And then the next person comes along and if it's decentralized, you decentralize and all that happens is you're just yo-yoing back and forward. There's, there's multiple jokes uh, on that theme. And, and, and the idea I don't think we've ever harnessed really powerfully or even, even looked under the hood and said, what are the incentives driving people? Uh, and, and then what levers do we really have? You know, you can just issue more policy or you can just issue more standards or accredit people or whatever it is. And it will have some effect, but not perhaps the consequential effect to transform the system. That's why I've specified it over 10 years, by the way, because... I don't think any of this is change in a hurry. I don't think I don't I don't think yeah. we I don't think we are able to be architects of rapid change. The pandemic has changed some things, but there's a huge there's almost an incentive for some people to go try and get back to the old normal, not the new normal, and that worries me. So I, I don't know the answer uh, yeah. to your question. I, but there's a mix of things that might that might help us to get to a better place across 2030 to 2030. Yeah. I can I just come back on a couple of things. Uh, one is, I think it, it emphasizes your point earlier, uh, which is about kind of learning and, and policy learning, not, not just organizations learning, but kind of system yeah. learning. You know, everything from pilot schemes to, to more national evaluations, and then most importantly, acting upon that um, so we don't, don't repeat. But having done some work on decentralization, I think you're absolutely right there. That there is a swing. But the danger is that as much as we emphasize the bottom up and ownership at the local level, we're working within systems that are, have got public accountability. Uh, you know, 140 billion pounds of public money goes through the NHS. You know, we need accountability for that. So what that balance is, I, I don't have the answer <laughs> today for that. But how we how we kind of get a suitable balance making sure that citizens and patients have that uh, input um, in, in, into those sort of public health systems, I suppose. And, and I understand the Westminster system is the politicians saying, well, we are the elected representatives of those people and we are the guardians of taxpayers' funds and therefore we must have a say. I do know, though, the, the NHS England, which I know better than the other NHSs, um, you may not realize this fully if you're just working in it. Um, you do, of course, as researchers, because you sort of stand back from it a little bit, but it is terribly top down compared to other health systems. If you contrast it with the Australian health system, for example, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying I'm making this observation. Australian health system is much less top down than the NHS England, for example, and other health systems are too. So I get the Westminster public accountability, 140 billion pounds, all that sort of stuff, but it is very top down compared to other health systems. And I would love, Mark, for us to continue this conversation outside here to see if we can figure out, maybe even write a paper on what's the best mix, because you've you've touched a nerve, um, I think, uh, in 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 the search for how might we get to 2030. Great, thanks. Hey, thanks. I've got one hand remaining, and uh, being as I can't multitask, try and keep an eye both on the chat and the hands. I think it's probably easier from now on if we just move to the hands. So, uh, to Lucia, you've uh, indicated a hand, and then I'm looking for hands after that. Thank you, and thank you for a brilliant talk. I really enjoyed that. I'm I'm tuning in from Scotland, where it's like Birmingham too, but worse. 
um, but I'm in, <laughs> I'm in global public health. Um, I've got a sort of comment and question about the future of research and research institutions and perhaps research institutional culture in relation to health systems and acknowledging all those important things, learning health systems, complex adaptive systems, emergence, feedback, all that stuff. And I think my question is around being reflective on ourselves. Should our complexity thinking extend to our own system, the academic system? Um, and what are the incentives? Not unlike the remarks from Mark and Ross, I think. What are the incentives for research to enable this bottom-up, you know, to equip bottom-up perspectives for data-driven decision-making? I'm not sure there are very many. How can we push that envelope to be reflexive of ourselves as well as others, to be critical as we embrace complexity? In global public health, there is marginal accountability of Western researchers to local contexts. Um, and building those relationships, you know, could we start to embrace things like naive rationality? As we all know, evidence isn't alone going to save the day. <laughs> COVID-19 is the perfect example. It's the same pathogen and look at all the different responses. This is not evidence alone. I don't need to convince this group of that. Um, yeah, so that's my question and thank you again. I, uh, it's a wonderful question. I don't even know how to begin to answer it, but um, let me just make a couple of observations. I do worry about research and its place and standing, and I do worry about evidence. I know that different people have different views about what evidence is. For clinicians, they uh, doctors I'm talking about firstly, um, they profess to be driven by science and randomised trials but they are swayed like everybody is by a narrative and a story and a patient history, which is often much more about the humanities than it is about the randomized trial. Um, I think we're, we're full of our own biases as researchers. And there's one strand of research that's more scientific and says you have to be terribly objective. And another strand, which many of us have a foot in the camp of, which is we're more in the humanities and that, you know, bias is fine because everyone's biased and you can, uh, you can, be a, be a researcher advocate um, and, and not worry about that. So I don't know what the answer is. Um, it's a bit like the health system, isn't it? The closer you get to research, the more you realize you know less than you started out when you started on your journey. But um, yeah, again, the NHS, you know, uh, NHS Scotland, NHS England, um, Ireland and, uh, and, and, and Wales too. You've got a bigger proportion of health services researchers of almost any other country I know because of NIHR, uh, because of a tradition of teaching and researching about the NHSs. Um, so, so you, you, I'm not going to say you don't know how lucky you've got it, Lucia, but um, there's 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 a big proportion of research um, that matters in the in the NHS in the uh, in the health systems of the UK than there is in almost any other country. But yes, you're unpicking a scab for me, unpicking a big sore spot, which is what's the status of research and what are we going to do with research and the production of knowledge and knowledge mobilization? These are all fantastic questions. Okay, got one hand still up at the moment. That's Beck. So uh, over to you. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Jeffrey, for a great talk. Um, I work in Art West Midlands at the University of Birmingham. And, um, one of the I, I, I'm a great lover of complexity science and systems thinking, but one of the things I see is our human brains find it more challenging. I find it more challenging, but how do we embed it with all of the people across the system that we need to work with to make the change? So the public professionals, you know, I'm, I'm a medic by background, and you know, we are more on the positivist linear thinking end of the spectrum, as you were just alluding to. So how do we tackle that challenge to get these ways of working and thinking into the mainstream? So we've been trying to teach um, uh, groups of people in policy making land in in the um, in Australia, in our federal government, our equivalent of Whitehall in Canberra. Well, we've been trying to teach them about systems thinking, and the policy makers, to their absolute credit, um, this is only a partial end answer, by the way, Beck. The policy makers, to their credit, uh, came to us and said, 
you know, we can't just keep on doing policy, issuing it, expecting it to make a difference in some sort of linear way. And we've heard what you've been saying and writing about, can you give us a series of um, workshops? And so we did. And uh, I'd like to see more people like that. I'd like to see some, and your own profession, medicine. Some people are fantastic systems thinkers. Some people are, they don't just see the patient or the group of patients that they're responsible for in front of them, but they see the system and how the patient has to navigate through and they have to navigate through to get a good outcome. But some people aren't. They're very, as you say, positivist and uh, linear. Maybe have we done enough work in the medical curriculum, the undergraduate and postgraduate medical curriculums to uh, expose people to the bigger system of which they're part? I don't know. What do you think? I hope it's getting better. So I'm, I'm a public health medic, which probably is why I ended up with this way, way of looking at the world. But we <laughs> yeah. do more of this sort of training in, in public health. And I, th I think we've got a lot of work still to do. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just public health. It's across the whole system and, and uh, all the professions that are involved. I do a lot of work with midwives as well, um, even getting to the stage where evidence-based medicine in the traditional positivist sense is embedded. So, you know, the trial evidence is implemented in practice is tricky never mind the more complex ways of trans transforming systems. So I've got a lot of work to do, but um, excited to see how it develops and be involved in it in some way. One thing I've come to a conclusion about, which is a partial answer, is um, you can't wish the complexity away. So you can try and ignore it, and you can try and do linear things, what I'm describing as linear things, positivist things, but they're not going to work as well if you haven't navigated and negotiated and worked with and through the people in the system. Uh, so, you know, you're only gonna get so far. You've got one hand, may, sorry, that may be a legacy hand. So while I'm gonna ask Mark whether that's a legacy hand or not, I'll uh, put my own question to Jeffrey. Now, um, you know, Jeffrey, complexity, I mean, complexity, three figures, you know, have to remember three figures, 60, 30, 10. Um, I prefer simplicity to complexity. So if you if you only had to focus on one of those figures, which one would it be? Like, for example, if you said, if we deal with the 60, will the 10 take care of itself? Or should the 10 be a priority? So, you know, if somebody put your heart, arm behind your back and twisted it, is there one of those figures that's more important than the other? So let me, exp um, let me address that this way. Um, we've been working on harm for about 30 years, concertedly, the patient safety um, uh, movement. And that number 10% has remained sticky for those 30 years. So we try to look at that with a complexity lens and so we asked the question um, about 10 years ago, what about if we still did all the things we're currently doing to try and stamp out harm, to reduce harm from 10% to whatever number we can get it down to, which we've been spectacularly unsuccessful at, and why don't we look at the other um, uh, end of the telescope. Why don't we look at how come so much care goes right? So if 10% is harm, 90% is unharm, where the patient gets care and they don't get harmed. So we started our resilient healthcare series of books um, about 10 years ago and said, let's think about something called safety too, when things go right and how come things go right so frequently. So that's a complexity way of looking at 10%. And looking at the other side um, of the uh, other end of the telescope. If you're pushing me really with your question, which I'm fudging on, as you can tell, is I would say, can we reduce the amount of waste, duplication, and um, futile care? Because if we could reduce the amount of waste in the system, every system, well, every human system always has waste, redundancy, uh, things that we shouldn't do that we do. Uh, etc. If we could reduce that, we would have more money in the system because we'd have less redos, we'd have less things that we do in the first place that should never be done, um, and we'd have more money to deploy. So Beck could have more money for public health, and uh, and um, Callista could have more money. For, uh, uh, no, who said about social care? Catherine can have money, more money for social care. You guys could have more money for research. So I think in any system, there's so much. Um, duplication, excessive administrative burden, bureaucracy um, uh, that could be streamlined and we could re reduce the costs of care and deploy that money for really better purposes. 
there are operations that go on all the time that just shouldn't happen. Um, no hands at the moment. So if there are no more hands, I, I'm happy to have another go while people are formulating their questions. Um, yeah, I think, again, if I was asked my own question, I think I'd probably take the different view and try to, min I, mean, I know you say we've tried to minimise the 10 for 30 years and have so, but I mean, I really am getting a bit tired of all these inquiries that come up with, um, you know, lessons will be learned when patently they've not been learned because I think Private Eye had one of the best takes on healthcare inquiries. I think they went back to the Bristol inquiry about, you know, thousand whenever it was and they said look if you just cut and pasted the recommendations from bristol it would have saved francis doing most of the stuff he did and now presumably if we go back to shrewsbury and if we go back to morecambe bay and you know, every time we seem to be having this oh lessons will be learned and i think people are now getting a bit tired of this so how can we learn lessons that we claim we're learning after each thing that go wrong or indeed, how can we learn lessons from things that go right yeah, I, I, I wrote an analysis of eight inquiries in six different countries in 2006, which included Bristol. And what I used to say, the joke I used to uh, give at conferences is, I can write the next report. I can write the recommendations and I can write what the system should do. I just don't know, it hasn't happened yet. And I don't know which country it's happened yet in, but I can write it because they all look the same. It's all about, well, we need more leadership, we need better culture, and we need uh, teamwork, and we need better systems, and we need uh, more compassionate staff. You know, I mean, the list is the same for all of them. Absolutely right. Private eye is correct. So, um, so, so um, what that tells you is a couple of things. One is implementation is infinitely harder than doing, in, doing an inquiry. And um, therefore, for uh, are we doing that linear thing of saying right we need more leadership let's train everybody let's uh, we need more teamwork let's um you know sort of insist on it or whatever we've done and have we really sat back and said how are we really going to improve care for patients uh and how can we do that in a compact almost um uh, ac across across an entire system or uh or a whole lot of local systems uh, with responsibility and charged with enough authority to improve the care for patients. I once put it to a health system, shall we do a randomized trial? Shall we take all the rules away and all the policies on a random sample of hospitals and leave the others with all the rules in place and see which ones deliver better care after three years? But no one would take me on. So we don't know if we're over-specifying we're putting in too many procedures and policies and insisting if I go on the wards of hospitals, say, just for example, in the NHS and ask people what's driving their behavior, they won't say the 2,500 procedures and policies that have been issued in all the policy manuals. They'll probably say to me, I'm sorry, I don't even understand the question. Could you leave me alone while I get on with delivering care by my fingernails, by the seat of my pants? Okay, thanks, Jeffrey. We've got a question or a hand from Russell. This is scary. Okay. Russell has Russell has questions to challenge me that um, I will not know the answer to. Yes, Russell. Um, why do you think in the world is doing this best then? Not not looking I, at the bottom, but where do you think which hospital, which health system is doing it best? I don't know the answer to that. Where do you? I don't know either. I don't... And where the experts? What does that tell you? Well, I know it's not the United States for a start. No, it's, it's, it's not the US. Anyone like to chip in with their sort of, it's almost like one of these quiz shows, you know, pick a country, anyone got, uh, <laughs> anyone got a suggestion? And the famous league table, wasn't it? WHO about 2002 said it was France, didn't they? And they got so much stick on that, they've never repeated the exercise. So um, yeah, the Commonwealth Fund does that with 16 countries. Sometimes it's France, sometimes it's the UK, the NHS England, sometimes it's Australia, or, you know, it depends what you're measuring also. Is it primary care? Is it acute care? Is it social care? Is it age care? Yeah. 
certainly if you, it, there's, a, there's a relationship between are you pretty good and do you have enough resources in at the front end? You know, have you got a good proportion of GDP allocated to healthcare? So there's some relationships like that. They're correlations, of course. They're not deterministic, but um, yeah. What do you, you think, pu- Russell? What do you really think? Well, you, you published a recent study looking at the impact of COVID in different countries. Yeah. Do you want to say which which country dealt with it best or was dealing dealing with it best? So that was an early study, early in the pandemic. We asked this question. We we did publish that study. We are we looked at forty countries. We looked at thirty six OECD countries and four other health systems. Um, uh, for which there was data. And we asked the question, when the pandemic hit, what was most important of three things? And so I can ask this question if you haven't seen the paper. What's most important? That you were really prepared pre-pandemically for a pandemic, you just didn't know it was COVID-19. So you were already organized, you had a public health system that was responsive and ready to go if there was a pandemic and the politicians hadn't fallen asleep at the wheel and all those sort of things. Secondly, that you went as soon as the pandemic hit quite early to stringency, mask wearing, social distancing, lock up, et cetera. Or thirdly, you went um, soon after the pandemic hit to a st- status um, and vaccination program, i.e. you said to people, we're gonna let you know, you can have a test, anybody can have a test um, uh, and, and uh, you're gonna know your status um, most people in the population will go and get a test and you'll know your status. And then once the vaccina- vaccinations come along, and that's going to be in several months' time because they weren't there then, you'll get a vaccination. Which of those three is the most important? Obviously, all three are important. But which would you have? It's back to your phrasing of a question, Martin. Which of the three, I'll ask you, Martin, as the proxy for everybody, which of those three would you think is most important? All are important. Being organised pre-pandemically, going to stringency, or giving everybody a test that needed one, even if they just felt like, I don't know, I feel like I need a test. I'm going to fudge it like you fudge my question, Jeff. <laughs> uh, I mean, the only comment I'd make is, first of all, it depends how you define preparedness, because uh, mm-hmm. you know, obviously you don't define it in the way that was it John Hopkins um, defined it. In other words, they somebody did a study, I think it was them, saying that the two best prepared countries in the world were the UK and the USA. And, uh, you know, as the quiz shows often go, you know, ah, ah. so, you know, if finding preparedness properly, possibly. Um, I know Ian Greener, again, people are advertising all over the place. You were advertising your stuff. Uh, got a handbook on coming out next year, in which Ian Greener is doing a chapter on COVID. And I think his big measure is, I think, the number of tests per, um, per positive cases. So I think that would be his answer. Um, but yeah, stringency seems to come out. A lot. I know the Oxford um, sort of studies are saying that it's partly stringency, it's partly early, acting early. And I think one of the latest ones they come up with is trust, not trust in government per se, but trust in fellow citizens. So yeah. to be honest, I don't know. Take it for any, any one of those. Anybody else? You've had time to look up the study now, of course, and you've probably had time to look at the conclusion. But so this was early in the pandemic, and and what we uh, what our study suggested was widespread testing, broad based testing was most important. Now, if you just step back from that, that's a complex adaptive system type solution. So if you have a population of anyone, and enough of them know their status, and enough of them have a status of positive for COVID enough of them, there'll always be outliers who still, you know, go on a bus and all those sort of things, but enough of them will do the right thing. So that allows you to say, I'm going to trust the complex adaptive system if I give the complex people in the, in the population enough information to do the right thing, to do the right thing. So we found preparedness was important, but not pivotally essential. The NHS was as at least in principle, as organized as everyone, because it's got a very good public health system. So it's in principle prepared as much as any other system, um, and yet didn't do well uh, in, during the pandemic, especially in the first year. So we found that testing and giving, uh, putting trust in the population to do the right thing if everybody could uh, find out their, their COVID-19 status 
was the most important thing. But that was a very early study. We published that in June and the pandemic only started in sort of February, March. Yeah. And events overtook us. Okay, uh, we've got a few minutes left. So if there's anyone, particularly anyone who hasn't asked a question yet, um, I'm happy to take any set of final questions. Or if not, being as it's uh, getting, getting, particularly in Australia, if people want to uh, have their cocoa, that's fine. So uh, a bit like an auctioneer now, we're into that sort of the hammer's about to drop. So unless there are any final attempts at questions, okay, go in for the first or second time. Okay, well, as I say, it's getting a bit late in Australia, so I'd like to thank um, everyone for joining us, but particularly Jeffrey, who, um, you know, as I said, that tour de force, and before he reminds me again, delivered exactly the time. So uh, thanks a lot, Jeffrey. It'd be really great if uh, you can visit us in due course and uh, do this face to face. But uh, thanks for a really great session. And I know, you know, generated lots of thoughts, lots of activity, lots of uh, things in the chat, lots of hands. So uh, great. Thanks very much. And um, hope we see you before not too long. Thank you indeed, Martin. And thanks for the invitation. Much appreciated. Okay. Bye, Jeffrey. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Bye.